I'm going to talk about striking a ba balance between availability and utilization in the cloud. This is joint work with my colleagues from MIT, Microsoft Research, and Hebrew University. In particular, Jeremy, my student, is here. Ask all of your hard questions from him. He can answer all of them instead of me. OK. So I want to drive home one high-level idea for you guys today. And that's the following. Imagine that you have some sort of a shared resource, like the internet. And you have some users that are using this shared resource. Okay? And you want to maximize the performance of this shared resource. Okay? So for example, you want to maximize the bandwidth that's allocated to each of these users. Okay? And so this is the de facto way that we write resource allocation problems in networking. We write an optimization function. It has an objective, and it has a bunch of constraints. And then we solve this optimization function. And so the main result that I want to drive home today is that we show that we can serve three times more users by changing this optimization function into a probabilistic one. So by taking probabilities into account. I'm going to tell you what I really mean by probabilities. The word probability, I'm probably going to say probabilities a lot during this talk. But the whole idea here is to have probabilistic optimization functions for resource allocation problems. So in particular, I want to zoom into the traffic engineering problem, which we've been hearing about throughout the day a lot. And I'm going to show that as one of the use cases of this probabilistic optimization method. So what is the traffic engineering problem? It's a classical networking problem. The question is, how do you want to allocate, configure the allocation of traffic on different networking paths? Okay? So you have a network. You want to configure traffic on it. For example, let's say that there are, there's a network that consists of Boston and Ithaca. It only has three links. And the capacity of each of these links is 10 gigabits per second. And there's a 20 gigabit per second traffic demand from Boston. What should I do? I want to maximize the utilization of this network. I want to satisfy this demand. So I'm going to, one very natural way of doing this is to divide this total demand across these three links. Right? So the job of the traffic engineering function in this case was very simple. You have 20 gigabits per second of demand. You have three paths divided 20 over 3, 20 over 3, 20 over 3. Okay. Everything's simple in a very simple case, but the problem becomes even more challenging when you have a billion dollar infrastructure, when you have a network as big as the internet, you have multiple cities. And so because the infrastructure is expensive, the metric of efficiency ends up being dollar per gigabit per second, which is how much money do you spend into moving one gigabit per second of data from point A to point B. And so we want to utilize this network as much as possible. Okay? And so the solution has been that we model the network as a graph. The cities will become nodes in the graph, and the edges will become, the fiber paths become edges in the graph. And then so we solve a linear program. For example, this is one linear program that I took a snapshot of from Infocom 2000. It's got an objective and a, and a set of constraints. Okay. So far, so good. Everything's good. But things didn't, so, and everybody has been starting to look into this, tra uh, this traffic engineering in a broad variety of environments. Like there is ISP networks, data center networks, wide area networks, which is really the focus of this talk is on the wide area network. And we, we heard about from Kumar, uh, from Praveen on NSTI 2018 s'mores paper. And Harry is also going to pre present, Harry is also going to present the FFC paper. So this is a very popular topic. But things have changed since 19 years ago. And the new things that has evolved into the traffic engineering problem is being able to maximize the utilization of the network, but also maximize the availability of the network that we have. And availability is something that failures impact them. So when a link fails, the traffic either has to be rerouted through the remaining of the network, or the traffic has to be dropped. And so availability and utilization are two targets that we want to maximize them at the same time. But they're kind of at odds with each other. If you, picture, if you remember the example in the beginning, if I utilize all of the links in my network 100% of the time, so I want to maximize my utilization, then when one of these links fail, then I'm losing traffic. So my availability goes down. And vice versa, if I want to have a high amount of availability, it means that I have to reduce the link utilization to some number such that when some failure happens, then the residual links can carry the leftover traffic. Okay, so this is hard to sort of write an optimization function that balances between the two. 
And so the problem that I'm interested in solving is traffic engineering under failures. And so today we are optimizing for worst case, but conceivable, maybe less probable scenarios. And we try to find our path allocations based on these worst case scenarios. And so the problem that happens is that we end up underutilizing our network a lot. And I want to illustrate that back, back to the same example that we have. We have Boston and Ithaca. And then we have these three paths between them. Okay? So same example, but now I want to be robust against K simultaneous link failures. Let's say K is 2 in this case. What this means is that if, if this link is down and this link is down, the entire traffic demand should be able to be carried across this remaining link. Because the capacity is 10G, it means that the traffic engineering formulation ends up carrying 10 gigabits per second on this network all the time because all the links are busy waiting for each other to fail. But this network is robust against K-link failures. So I want to show what happens really in practice, in real life. What I'm going to show you is that on the x-axis, there's time. And on the y-axis, I'm, I'm plotting the normalized link utilization for you folks. And this is showing the two links between Boston and Ithaca, for example. So the blue link is carrying is the top link here. And the green link, and I hope the color is visible, is the bottom link. So everything is all right, except on August 4th. Something bad happened on August 4th. A fiber cut happened. It happens. Failures do happen in a network. And what happened was that this green link was able to carry the entire traffic, not only its own traffic, but also the, tra the traffic from the blue link. And then its utilization shoots up. And then it goes down when the link comes back up. Right? All is good in here. What I'm more interested in is this portion of the graph, which is the rest of the year. Throughout the rest of the year, the utilization of this green link is around 20% somewhat. And so there is so much capacity that we're not using because this link is sort of busy waiting for this one incident on August 4th. And that's, that's the point that I want to drive on. Can we have done something more smart here? I have a basic question about the term underutilization. The rest of the year when the green link was being utilized at 20%, was the network rate limiting? Were there packets entering Boston destined for Ithaca that were being kept off the network in order to keep the utilization of the green line? That's a great question. So <laughs> traffic engineering and capacity planning goes, go hand in hand. And so what happens is that the network provider is over provisioning the capacity of this link such that it's satisfying the demand between Boston and Ithaca. And so what's, what I really mean by underutilizing is that you're putting too much capacity being ready for this. So there's not much rate limiting happening. And if, let's say, for the next three months, they observe the traffic and they realize that the traffic is going to increase by, say, 100 gigabits per second, they go in and they deploy another fiber wavelength on there. And so the problem that we really want to attack is that given the same network that you have, you could have carried a lot more traffic. Or you didn't really have to augment your network for the next generation, for the next three months or the next three years. OK. So. Our approach to traffic engineering under failure is as follows. We use the failure probability of different failure scenarios, and then we use them to reason about the likelihood of each of these failure scenarios. And then we provide a mathematical probability guarantees for availability of the network as a whole. For example, back to our, our familiar example, if you have Boston and Ithaca, and I just, I'm going to add a bit of information for you. I'm going to add the probability of failures of these different three links. I have this information because I've been observing the failure, failures of these links for the, say, past year or past three years. So I'm able to put some numbers in the probability of failures. So in this case, I'm going to do something very simple. I realize that this middle path has a higher failure probability compared to the two top and bottom ones. And so I'm just going to not route anything on this middle path. And I'm going to put 10 gigabits per second and 10 gigabits per second on the top and bottom ones. And I can show you that this means that I can carry 20 gigabits per second most of the time, 99.8% of the time over this network. And so notice that this is better than carrying 10 gigabits per second 100% of the time, because I'm just, I just gave up a little bit on availability, but I was able to carry twice more traffic. So basically, formalizing it as 
given an uncertainty vector, which carries the fa failure prob probability of failure of different links, what I would like to do is, as a traffic engineering algorithm, I would like to figure out the flow allocation vector or how to, defi how to divide my demand across these different paths. Yes? So are you assuming that the failures on these links are independent, or is there any correlation? I'll get to that. Right now, we're, what we are doing is that in this example, we assume independence, but our formulation carries also correlated link failures. Think of failure scenarios. Failure scenarios could be two links failing at the same time. I can also calculate the probability of that and put that into my formulation. OK. So for this network, I want to make a statement like the following. For all of the flows, 95% of the demand is satisfied most of the time, 95% of the time, for example. Think of this as something that's tunable, that the service provider decides on this. And the trick is that I'm going to flip this. Instead of saying 90% of the demand, I'm going to say loss will be 10, less than 10% of the demand, same, 95% of the time. And so that's the trick that enables us. Instead of saying demand is going to be satisfied, I'm going to say loss will be less than some, some percentage. And I'm going to solve the optimization formulation for this notion of loss. And so the problem is the following. We want to find these values x's. These are the output of the, my, my traffic engineering optimization function, such that is maximizes the throughput at all times. This is what we're used to think of, think of tra traffic engineering. And we're going to turn it into find these x values such that it minimizes the loss with some given probability beta. Okay. So how do we do this? If I have a way of defining a failure scenario like what I'm doing here, let's say that we think of a failure scenario like a maybe one link failure or a set of link failures, like a switch failed and five links failed. And if I can have a way of calculating the loss associated with this failure scenario, which loss is something that we can define, unsatisfied demand, packet loss, increased latency, and whatnot. Now having the probability, and if I have a way of having the probability, calculating the probability of this scenario, and if I have this for all of the possible failure scenarios, then given a target probability, let's say beta is 0.95, because this is the probability distribution function, and if I find a point in the graph where the area under the graph is 0.95, then this number means that with probability 95%, the loss is less than 10% of the demand in this particular realization. Right? So if I had the x values, if I had the allocation, and if I have a way of drawing this graph, then I can calculate the loss. And that's really the key technique that we're using. So in this case, we can say that loss will be less than 10% of the demand with probability 0.95. So what do we do? We don't really have this, because this comes from having one set of allocation. And so we write a function that is dependent of this value at risk and x, the variables, the allocations, that carries this probability of the scenarios where the probability of this, the loss is less than this. And then we write an optimization function that minimizes for this value. Okay. And so the optimizer behind the scenes goes over all the possible allocations, and then it finds the allocation that minimizes this value for us. So far, so good, but there's still a little bit of a trick here that even if you're minimizing loss with some probabilities, then are we, we're saying that with some probability, like in this case, 5% of the cases have, may have huge loss. And that's not really desirable. Like if you're a service provider and you're given some guarantees, even 99.99%, you're, you're still interested in the tail of the scenarios. And so the key point for service providers is that to be able to also minimize the loss associated with these tail of scenarios. And so instead of minimizing our formulation for the loss, we actually minimize for the expected value of loss of all of the tail scenarios when their loss is lo larger than the value at risk. So I won't go into the too much details of how the optimization formulation is written, but this is basically the intuition of writing it. And it's not, it, once this intuition clicks, then it's not actually that difficult to write the optimization function. Let's get into a little bit of details about what a scenario means for us. 
So z is a set of failure events, say z1, z2, up to zz. And so a failure event is where there's a set of the concept of shared risk groups. Shared risk groups are a set of risk groups that are sharing the same faith. So say all the links that go through the same power line. If the power line uh, goes down, then all of those links are down, or all those switches are down. And so, for example, Z1 could be that link L failed, and then Z2 could be that the switch failed that caused a set of links that may be including L failed. And so, if you start thinking about scenarios, then these failure events are independent, and they can contain correlated link failures, but I can multiply their probabilities to each other. So the number of failure events can be very large. Yeah, yeah. that's a good, good question to have. Uh, let me, let me couple, give me a couple of slides. Let me get there, yeah. So each failure event occurs with some probability that we are proposing to use historical data to obtain that probability. We also have a way of showing you that there is a distribution that kind of matches the historical probability that we obtained from Microsoft. But I'll get to there in a few slides. So our approach is called TVAR, Traffic Engineering Applying Value at Risk. And so given this set of failure events, a network state, this is what really we are interested in, a network state is a state of the network where some failure events happened. And so it, we are representing it by a variable Q, where Q is a binary random variable that says if, if this Q is one, it means that this failure event occurred. And so, for example, if I have this random variable, it means that this is a network with, say, these many states, and then this last one is true. So it's a network state where only the last shared risk group is down. And we can calculate the probability associated with each of these by just multiplying the probability of each different states. So zooming up a little bit from the details, of course, there are big challenges that we need to solve when we are thinking about this scenario-based approach. Scale is one of the main ones that Harry pointed out. But even before scale, there's fairness, and we have to be careful about fairness. Because when we are thinking about probability, probabilistically satisfying some of the demand, you may be able to increase your satisfaction of demand of some users and then starve some other users. And so we have to be really careful about how we define the loss function such that it's not starving some of the users. There's a challenge in traffic engineering that I found interesting, and it's considering for rerouting. So when, when a failure happens and this link goes down, the traffic engineering has to have a way of deciding on how to reroute. And notice that in this case, we already have decided on what we call paths or tunnels. And so we have a set of tunnels. Some of them go down. We want to route through this re remaining tunnel, but we have to decide on how to route it, like what percentage of the traffic we should send on this. So uh, the details of how we solve these challenges are in our upcoming paper at SICOM. But I do want to zoom into the scale problem and show you a, a technique. Any questions so far? Yes. How do you determine your scenarios? Is it just <coughs> historical? That's a really, really good question. So, we're still thinking about a better way of doing this. So right now, we define, we look at the data, and then we say, link failures are a, are a good scenario. And then all the wavelengths that are over the same fiber path is also a good scenario for correlated link failures. But I still don't have a way of looking at all the data and then coming up with a set of scenarios. It is possible to do this, but it's, a, it's an interesting challenge to solve. But by rerouting, do you mean the global rerouting or the local behavior of the routers might be to have? Local, local. So immediately when a failure happens, the router should decide how to, how to rechange the weights, how to, uh, how to route based on the new updated weights. And then after, say, the next five minutes, then the TE is going to calculate the new weights. OK, so you are assuming that the, the, the router's data plane is running kind of your logic that you define. What did it happen? How it computed the rerouting? Yeah, we're not really inventing anything here. We are using the same approach that prior work is using. That 
like what I was showing, one third, one third, one third. So the router knows 30%, 33%, 33%, 33%. When one of them goes down, maybe the router decides to do 50-50 or a different portion. And so this is the same uh, technique that is used by prior work of how to decide on this updated weights. Yes? So what about congestion? If you submit the uh, contract and the dropping packet, this also to this yeah, that's really the key idea here, that we want to define loss as this congestion. So in our formulation, the, the concept of loss ends up being unsatisfied demand. And unsatisfied demand sort of reflects your, poor, your idea about loss, because you have a demand, you won't be able to satisfy the entire demand, then that becomes your notion of congestion. Yes. So a question that makes me think of that I just don't know the answer. Does the utilization of the networks ever correlate with the probability of failure? Or are these? That's a really good point. Hmm. Does the utilization ever? I actually don't know the hardware well enough for anything to know. I think without running, I haven't run the data on it. So it would be very interesting if somebody has uh, the data on both of them, if there is a correlation. From a pure fiber optics perspective, if your fibers are deployed across the United States, then there is less correlation in that sense. But it is possible from a switch, if the fan gets heated up, or if <laughs> or, or sharks get more attracted to <laughs> fibers that <laughs> It's possible. Any other questions? OK, so quick note about fairness. So reminder that we want to find these x values that are minimizing loss with some probability. And so if I have a set of routes for a flow i, let's say I call it ri, and then x are these variables that the traffic engineering decided on, and y represent a binary variable that is whether or not this path, this tunnel is up or not. Then simply stated, the satisfied demand for this flow is the amount of traffic on this set of tunnels or paths that are up. And so in order for us to handle fairness, we have a starvation of our loss function. That is the worst case normalized unmet demand. What I mean by that is that we define our loss function to be basically demand minus satisfied demand, which is unsatisfied demand, and then we take the maximum value of that. So what I really want to do is that I would like to minimize the maximum unsatisfied demand. That's my loss function. You could also think of other loss functions. Let's say minimizing the average unsatisfied demand. A few words about scale. This is a picture of Google's B4 topology. It has 38 edges. And if you want to iterate over all the possible failure scenarios, it would be 2 to the power of 38 with, with 11 zeros on it. It's actually fine. It's not that bad. Like we, we show that you can iterate over all of those scenarios in one second. And we can write down, we can write the optim we can solve the optimization function in this case. But what ends up happening is that if the network starts scaling up, then quickly we become, it takes longer and longer to solve this optimization function. And so for example, for AT&T topologies with 112 uh, edges, it takes about two minutes to solve this uh, optimization function if you're considering all the possible failure scenarios. So the trick that we use in this case to avoid looking at all the possible failure scenarios is that because we know the failure probabilities, then we are going to grab scenarios based on their failure probabilities. And so what I'm showing here is that the scale of this graph is from 98% to 100%. If I were drawing it from 0 to 100, you wouldn't have seen any difference between these two. So the red line, the red bars are showing when you consider all the possible failure scenarios. And the sort of green bars are the ones that our approach, we are going and grabbing all the scenarios until we have a very good coverage of, in terms of probability of scenarios happening. And what that ends up happening is that that's just reducing the actual total number. Even though we, the, in terms of coverage of the probabilities, we're very high, the sheer number of total scenarios were pretty low. And we were able to solve the optimization function about 10 seconds. So overall, the way that the system works is that there is a t-bar optimization function. That's the optimization function that we write in the middle. 
we take the topology of the network, we take the flow demands of the entire network. The new piece that we're adding is the failure probabilities of different scenarios and the target availability rate that, say, as a service provider, you want to satisfy. We feed all of these into our optimization function, and then the output of the optimization function is these flow allocations per, per users. So to evaluate the idea, we ran a lot of simulations. We used a couple of topologies, the topologies that I showed you, B4, IBM, AT&T, and Microsoft. In terms of traffic matrices, we used four months of Microsoft's traffic matrices. And we were also very lucky. We got 24 traffic matrices from Yates. Uh, huge thanks to Praveen for helping us to, to get this going and debugging all the issues. The, Maybe a cute thing here is that actually we're, we're independent of tunnel selection algorithm. Our results show that oblivious tunnels are better, but this is something that can be run on top of your tunnel selection. You can use edge disjoint, you can use k shortest path. And we're comparing with a couple of uh, prior work, in particular uh, SMORE, which you heard from, uh, from Praveen, FFC, which you're going to hear from Harry, B4, this is actually the max-min al algorithm from uh, B4's paper, and just ECMP. Before showing the result, I want to give you a quick note about failure probabilities. This is important because th the entire approach is dependent on failure probabilities. What we did was that we measured the failure probabilities of Microsoft's network for about a year. And they don't allow us to publish the exact failure probability numbers. And so what I'm showing here is this CDF, cumulative distribution, distribution function, of the failure probabilities. But I can't really tell you the numbers, because maybe next year there would be a better number. But the point is, really, this number doesn't matter. Because we also show that there is a distribution, a variable distribution, that maps the shape of this distribution. The, po the point is that there's a big variation in terms of failure probabilities, three orders of magnitude difference between, say, a link that's in Chicago and maybe a link that's in LA. And that's what we need, to be we need to capture. That's really where there's the gains, because there's a huge variation in terms of failure uh, probabilities. And so we are sharing that in our paper. And so future work, what I would suggest is that don't really obsess about the exact failure probabilities. What really matters is the distribution here. And what is causing that huge gap between our uh, Chicago. Yeah, I thought about this a lot. Um, one thing that maybe the age of equipment is different, say a data center somewhere in the US might be older and have a lot more failure events happening to it. That's just one thing that I can link it into the data that we were observing. OK, so one of the main things that I want to uh, carry out is Understanding the, very, the difference with, or the trade-off between availability and scale. So what I want to do is that what I want to plot is scaling the demand. So take a network, take a traffic matrix, route that traffic matrix on this network. And then because we're using the actual data from Microsoft, for example, the, this network is going to satisfy the demand. But I'm going to scale this demand on the x-axis, and I'm going to show you when the network stops satisfying the demand. And so we're going to run our algorithm and uh, also the prior, your alg prior work algorithms. And we're going to measure availability as the probability of all the scenarios when the demand is not fully satisfied. And so for example, if I have a TE scheme that its bandwidth allocation is not able to fully satisfy the demand in 0.1% of the time, then we define that the availability of this scheme is 99.9%. This is a pretty stringent way of defining availability. So all the prior work, small FFC with one link failures or FFC with two link failures, ECMP and before, they sort of are able to scale the demand to some extent. But then after a while, they fall off the availability curve. And what we're able to do is that we're able to scale the demand up to 3.5 times and while having a relatively high availability. And so for even every availability ratio, we're able to satisfy more demand. Quick word about path selection. So 
What I'm showing here is that beta value on the x-axis and the loss value on the y-axis. These are the scenarios that we weren't able to really satisfy. And we, we experimented with different path selection algorithms. And so the lower is the better. And our results show that every time that we are using oblivious path selection, we get better results. So it's a good idea to use oblivious. And the last point in terms of evaluation that I want to make is error in probabilities. So like I said, probabilities are important. But considering some probabilities is more important than not considering probabilities at all. So what I'm showing here is that we introduce some noise in our probability estimates, and then we measure the error that we get compared to the ground truth that, let's say, assume that we have a ground truth of probabilities, and then I'm going to introduce noise into the probabilities, and I'm going to measure the, uh, the error that we get. And so even if your probability estimates are within 20% of the actual probabilities, then the error is about 6.7%. And there's no magic here. The point is that considering some probabilities are better than not considering probabilities at all. That's, way, that's why we are winning, basically. OK, so before giving a summary, we have a demo that I want to show you folks. Let me build up for the demo with one slide. And then what I want to show you is how we can use this technique not only for this traffic engineering problem, but also for set of sh resource sharing uh, problems. Okay? So the setup is as follows. Consider you have a shared resource, a data center, the internet, I don't know, roads, this room, anything that has a, sh a set of sh a shared resource. And what we want to do is that we want to share this shared resource. In order to turn this uh, optimization function that we might write into a probabilistic one, the first step is to define a failure scenario. Second step is to quantify the loss associated to failure scenarios. And the third step is to measure the probabilities associated with these scenarios. And then we can use our code base to turn the problem of sharing the resources into a one that has an objective with minimizing the loss. And I want to show you how we can do this for S'mores uh, allocation algorithm by asking Praveen to come here to write his formulation and asking Jeremy to turn it into a probabilistic one. So maybe help them with a round of applause. <laughs> We just came up with this like during lunch. And so this is very fresh. So first, I think it would be good if Praveen tells us about the optimization function. Uh, thankfully, he didn't go through the details of the optimization function in his talk. So this is, this is good to remind us what the optimization function objectives are. And then we hear from Jeremy how to turn it into probabilistic one. Yeah, you have. Better? It's, it's not changing the amount of time. Oh, it did. It did. It did. It did. Okay. Yes. Do it again. Yes. All right. So I guess this is the yeah. This is the combination for small. So in this case, we can actually the variables. Here, here we have the input, which is, which is the input graph, standard generation of the D D vertices and the edges, and then we we compute a set of paths. So let's say by the set of paths, and by S T shows the set of paths from S O S S to a destination D, and then we have uh, the actual linear traffic matrix, and then we have similarly as as the paths we have E S T generating the linear from generating the demand from S O S S to a destination D, but for each edge we have the capacity. And what our objective here is to minimize the maximum utilization of the network. So for that, we first define the objective function, which is just variable z. And we say that utilization of every link should be less than this variable z. And we want to minimize z. So this will automatically minimize the maximum link utilization. And how do we get the link utilization? Ue is the utilization of each edge. For this, what we do is we compute how much traffic is going over that path, over that edge. So for that, what we do is, for that edge, 
we find all the paths that are taking that edge or link, and then we compute how much traffic uh, is going over that path. So that is denoted by uh, the product of the demand uh, demand that's going over that path for that particular source and destination, and the weight of that path, the weight of that path used for that source and destination pair. So this gives the this sum, when you sum it over all possible paths, this gives the total amount of traffic that's going over an edge, and we just divide it by the capacity of the edge. So this gives the utilization, and so we minimize the uh, maximum utilization. And the last constraint is simply just making sure that the weight of each path is greater than zero. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, so as Praveen said, um, this is the formulation for Smores LP. Um, the biggest difference here is that uh, in the formulation that Manya explained for the T-bar, we obviously remember this graph um, where instead of having one single scenario like Smore where there are no failures, um, we have a lot of scenarios with certain loss associated with each scenario and a certain probability associated with, with all those scenarios as well. And the goal is basically, if this represents the beta probability, we want to minimize, we want to, uh, minimize these worst case losses here. And so in order to do that, we basically have to have a utilization for every edge and for every scenario. So these UEs here have to be turned into scenario-based utilization. So we can make them two-dimensional as U, and then in that scenario, the utilization on that edge. And then that means that this max utilization it's also a scenario based, so these Z's now become ZS. And then the one thing we also have to do is change these weights into normalized weights. So, and as you mentioned. Can you use a different color? I'm not sure if people can see it. These are the changes that oh. we're being made. Okay. Yeah, we can try red. Is this better? <laughs> yeah. So, those are the changes into the original formulation. So, basically, making these into scenario based utilizations and max scenario based um, utilization. And then um, I think we mentioned briefly in Monia's talk as well about uh, rerouting. And so when you have three tunnels, basically if one of them fails, then you have to normalize the weights on these tunnels. So this WP prime can basically be normalized weights depending on what scenario you're in. Normalized weights. And then these uh, also will have to be over all scenarios, these constraints. Um, and now we have a vector of z, which is, yes? Are the, are the wp primes additional variables that you're inserting into the formulation, or are they just values that can be calculated as a linear function of the wp? Variable? Yeah, so I think they can be calculated as a linear function just based on number of available, you just divide them basically by number of available tunnels um, in that residual specific scenario, residual okay. tunnels. Um, and then now that we have this vector of z, which in this case we define our loss here as the utilization. So we have a vector of the max utilization on all, across all links for every scenario. Um, we can change the objective function to be instead of just minimizing that z, uh, we have, if we imagine the expected value of this to be the sum of the probability of that scenario times the z, or in this case the loss in that scenario. And then we want to take the average over the worst cases, so over the one minus beta cases. So we do multiply by one over one minus beta. And then we also want to filter out all these scenarios with, if this loss is a value alpha, for example, at this uh, beta percentage, then we want to filter out all those betas by subtracting um, basically by alpha from all of these z's, and then we add the alpha back in at the end. And this represents what is called a conditional value at risk or the average uh, tail, the average of the beta tail losses for this example. And so I guess that's uh, one way that you can take a um, Praveen's solution for minimizing the maximization on all edges and then look at that across all scenarios and try and minimize the worst case in the one minus beta probability. Yeah, so the point is that he just came up with this over lunch. And so what I want to convey to you folks is that if you have a resource allocation problem and you're thinking about how to turn it into a probabilistic one, we have the code base, we have the, the algorithm. And uh, I would very much look forward to having, for example, Stefan's work on probabilistic verification and enabling other ways of doing probabilistic algorithms with a technique like this. And so with that, thank you so much, Jeremy, and thank you, folks.